Episode 17 with Ruben Gonzalez. Very special and, might I say, timely edition of Barn Raisers, conversations with the world's ultimate team players. My name's Dan Stones, your team dynamics and culture specialist. What exactly does that mean? Put very simply, I'm passionate about challenging, inspiring and equipping teams of all shapes and sizes from all over the world to work better together. I speak, write, train, live and breathe, all things team related. I'm also a father, a husband, and my wife and I once won a karaoke competition singing a duet, which is shocking considering the level at which we sing. So you may have noticed this edition of Barn Raisers is a little late hitting the shelves, and there's a perfectly good reason for that. If you're listening today, which is the 9th of February, then you might know that today is the big opening ceremony for the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea. And if you know anything about my guest for today's show, Ruben Gonzalez, then you'll see why things have panned out that way. So to all the listeners out there, both new and old, thank you for spending some time with us. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for sharing and telling your friends about the show. So now we're all caught up, let's not wait another second. I want to introduce you to our special guest on this Winter Olympics commemorative edition, Mr. Ruben Gonzalez. Why would anybody in his right mind want to jump on a sled and hurl himself down an icy mountain at over 80 miles per hour. At the age of 21, Ruben Gonzalez took up the sport of luge and started training for the Olympics. Four years and a few broken bones later, Ruben made his Olympic dream come true. But he didn't stop there. Ruben kept training and at the age of 47, he was competing against 20-year-olds at the Vancouver Winter Olympics. That's right, Ruben is the first and only person to ever compete in four Winter Olympics, each in a different decade. Now that's just mind-blowing. Now he's 55 years old and he's still competing. He's not at South Korea, but he is in training and hoping to become the oldest person ever to compete in the Winter Olympics in 2022. Ruben Gonzalez is also one of the most popular speakers in America. His best-selling book, The Courage to Succeed, has helped inspire countless people to achieve their goals and dreams. But despite all of Ruben's stunning achievements, Ruben also happens to be one of the best team players I know. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but I think what's most unique about Ruben is that he actually collaborated his way to the biggest show on earth to make it in what most people would consider to be a purely solo sport. But when you get to hear the story... It's not really a surprise. In his younger days, Ruben also forced his way onto an NCAA Division I college soccer team, purely by being the best teammate on the roster. And he still counts his time with a team working at a fast food chain as being one of his most cherished team memories. Now it's one thing to talk about passion and excitement, but it's another to bring it every day, no matter how hard things get, no matter what obstacles might lie in the way. But Ruben manages to do this every day. Whether he's out on the stage speaking to packed out auditoriums, training for his next Olympics, or just another crazy adventure, excitement and passion ooze from this man. It really was a pleasure and a privilege to get to spend some time with Ruben, and I know you're going to get so much from this conversation. So get ready to be inspired, and let's go for gold. Ladies and gentlemen, four-time Olympian, Mr. Ruben Gonzalez. The first thing I wanted to ask you was, what was that moment of discovery when you really first realized that you wanted to become an Olympian? You know, uh, uh, Dan, when I was was 10 years old, I, I saw the Olympics on TV for the first time. 1972 Sapporo Winter Olympics, Japan. And I was hooked, you know, I, I thought, I, 
I just want I put him up on a pedestal and I thought I want to be one of those guys. It was never about the uh, the medal for me. It was about walking around that opening ceremonies and being in that club. And but it was a pipe dream because I was always the last kid picked for PE back then and so uh I kind of put it on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> and was it the loose straight away that you saw? What was that event that so you saw or was it just the whole thing? How what was it that really grabbed you? I don't know if this was ever shown in, in, in Australia, but there was this movie called uh, 16 Days of Glory, and then uh, it was a, a whole series of movies that were basically documentaries of the Olympics by uh, um, Greenspan. I forget the guy's last first name. But anyways, they're classics out here. Before that, back in the in 16 Days of Glory was a, a documentary of the 84 Olympics, Los Angeles. But back in the 70s, he had this show called The Olympiad. It was a 30-minute show, which were all these little vignettes. And so watching that after having seen the, the Olympics, you know, on TV, watching that as a kid, that just, oh, my gosh, I want to be one of those guys. <laughs> and uh, but it wasn't until I was 21 that um, I was watching the Sapporo games, the, the, which is, um, let's see, not Sapporo, the, um, uh, oh, my gosh, the Sarajevo games in 1984. And uh, I see Scott Hamilton, the figure skater. He's a little tiny guy. He wins the gold medal. 18-year-old kid, must have weighed 100 pounds soaking wet, and he wins, right? <laughs> and, and he wouldn't wear sequins, and I like that about him either, right? He said, I don't wear sequins like this. <laughs> but, but, but I thought, man, if that little guy can do it, I can too. And so all of a sudden, I had the belief, right? And as a 21-year-old, which is way too late to start a sport, and, and I'd never seen the luge on TV at that point in my life. But um, I got excited. I went to the library. I got a big book about the Olympics, and I started looking at the sports. And five minutes, I realized summer's out. you got to be a super athlete to do any of this <laughs> stuff. No way. And then I'm looking at the winter sports, and I thought, you know, my nickname in high school was Bulldog because I was always very tenacious and perseverant. I got to find a sport with a lot of broken bones. Maybe be a lot of quitters. I won't quit. <laughs> so, uh, so I picked. I ended up picking the luge, and I'd never seen it on TV. I mean, if I had seen it, there's no way I would have done that. I had a little picture of a guy in a luge. I thought that's the one for me. I didn't even know where the track was. I lived in Houston, Texas, which is really hot wow. and humid. Never seen snow before, and I go pick up winter sport. I wrote Sports Illustrated a letter. asked them, where do you go learn how to luge? They said Lake Placid, New York. I called them up, and I talked myself into a beginner class. And four years and a few broken bones later, I'm in the Olympics. I mean, it's crazy. Wow. That, that, is, a, that is a crazy story. What was the reaction? I mean, you're 21. I don't know if you were out of home, in home. But, but talking to your parents, for instance, what was the, the reaction from them when you said, right, I've got some news. We need to have a chat. <laughs> well, my parents, my dad's a chemical engineer. And, and my mom's a housewife. And they're very uh, protective of their kids, right? Overprotective and risk averse. And when I came telling them I was going to do the luge, they, they didn't like it at all. They thought, man, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to get hurt. They just didn't want me to see, see me get hurt. They've never seen me slide. They would wait till I would bring the, the tape home after the Olympics. And, um, and, and then I talked my brother into it, the third Olympics, which was uh, uh, Salt Lake. Five years before that, I talked him into getting started. And uh, and he did. And we made Olympic history. We both we both got to compete. But uh, Salt Lake was just a few months after 9-11. Right. Mm -hmm. And everybody was talking about how it was going to be a target. Right. Oh, they're going to blow up the uh, the athletes. Right. And my mom didn't want us to go. And I said, look, if I if they blow us up there, at least I die happy. OK, so don't worry about me. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> So now they're proud now that they you know that I survived, but back then it was a different matter. Yeah, and and obviously you're born in Argentina, so Argentinian background. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing luge isn't a isn't a big sport <laughs> over there either, is it? No, no, we've got the Andes, which are huge mountains, and we have a ski team, but there's they, they don't care about winter sports. All they care is about soccer. I mean, if there's no soccer ball involved, uh, forget it, right? Um, in fact, when we finished the opening ceremonies in Salt Lake City. Uh, we crossed the, this little bridge to get into the the Olympic Village, and I, and I call this cousin of mine in Buenos Aires, and I says, "Hey, did you want? Did you see us? Right? There's only 15 of us. I'm easy to pick out. Yeah. I'm the old one." <laughs> <laughs> and she said, "No, the opening ceremonies were preempted by a second division soccer match. I mean, so yeah, wow. I'm never gonna get a fat head." <laughs> <laughs> about it. Walking down the streets back back in Argentina is pretty pretty easy gig for you. 
No problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask for everyone that's listening and, and for myself, I've never done it either. I, I think I'd like to, but it's a, probably a different story. But what's it feel like to hurl yourself down that, that icy mountain at 90 miles an hour? You know, Dan, I hated it. I mean, I was so scared because uh, most guys that start the luge, they start when they're 10 years old, eight years old, right? And little 10 year olds, they're not afraid of anything. They're bulletproof. I mean, you take, tell a 10 year old to jump off the roof of the house, they'll do it, right? And so they're fearless and, and they go from a lower and they work them up really slow, right? So they're going 20 miles an hour and then maybe next month they'll go 30 miles an hour and then 40 and then they'll keep them there for a couple of years maybe, right? And they're learning technique and they're relaxed and they're cool. And uh, they don't get to the men's start till they're 19 years old. Well, with me, I started at 21 and they had to cram 10 years of learning into two two years. They said, you're going to get hurt, okay? And, but my mindset was a broken bones of temporary inconvenience because, you know, bones heal and uh, they'll be stronger later yeah. <laughs> and I'll be back. I, I will be back. And, uh, and I just kept, kept coming back and I, and I learned it, but I was always scared. I white knuckled it. I mean, holding that the handles in your steel, white knuckling it the whole, the first 25 years. It wasn't until uh, about a year before the, the Vancouver Olympics that this coach that understood how the mind works, he he walked me through it and, and got over the fear. Now, now I'm sliding better than ever because I'm cooler and, uh, you know, mentally stronger. And now I just got to get the body, uh, you know, up to par. Getting there. Getting there. That sounds great. And tell me the it's time. Scary. The thing I wanted to learn, though, is the time fact. Everyone says that time shifts depending on what you're doing in the experience. We have good times, time flies. We have yeah. other times it goes slow what's the time like when you when you're on the on the run is it quick or is it like the longest two minutes of your life it's funny i've done a lot of interviews over the years nobody has ever asked me that and it's a great question it it, it takes forever oh my god <laughs> it takes years <laughs> and i get to the you, you're flying down that track 80 yeah. 90 miles an hour you know some 140 clicks uh pulling six g's on some of the curves right if you have a fast straightaway in a in a hairpin curve six g's right the astronauts on the shuttle they would experience two and a half g's on takeoff mm. uh so on blast off right and uh plus you're scared and so gosh it takes forever and i get to the bottom i'm totally out of breath like i you know i just uh, adrenaline flowing big time and the Germans, who started when they were kids, and they're they're incredible. They get to the bar. They, they look like they're reading a paperback, laying on a hammock the whole way down. I mean, they're so <laughs> relaxed. They get off their sled. Their heart rate hasn't even gone up. And then they look at at their split times, talk with coach. Me, it takes me five minutes just to get my breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I imagine that's what it'd be like. You're either talking a million miles an hour and just not making sense to anyone until everything just calms down again for a little bit. <laughs> All right, let me ask then, you've done a lot of crazy stuff then. Uh, let's call luge aside and, and doing luge. You've done a lot of crazy stuff. Can you maybe rattle off just a couple of things again for the listeners to complete this sort of picture of of Ruben Gonzalez and, and why you love these things so much? You know, on the one hand, I like doing stuff like that. I like the challenge. I like to challenge myself. Uh, I'm thinking uh, I'm, I'm ADD big time. Okay. And so I get bored easy. I get bored and I need a challenge. And when I was a kid, I read a lot of Hemingway. And so he talked about, you know, the snows of Kilimanjaro. And so that put the idea of Kilimanjaro in my, in my head. And I've always admired, you know, mountaineers, right. Especially yeah. coming from Houston, it's such a flat place. And so I'm, uh, I met a guy and who'd climbed, he's working his way through the seven summits. He's climbed Everest already. And he's taking people up 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 Killy many times and so you know greg reed who you've had on one of your shows yeah. and i we put together a program we hired him we brought in a bunch of people and we we went up to and we made it right but it was tough i mean he said look guys uh uh you do what i say you step where i step you pee when i pee you rest when i rest you sit you do everything i do for the next five days and if you listen you can get a cool picture up at the top right yeah. uh but if you feel any discomfort at all things happen real get bad really quickly at altitude so you'd let me know because otherwise you'll be sorry and uh, i didn't listen i was a hard head you know my toes were kind of hurting on the way down i ended up losing a bunch of of, of uh, toenails mm -hmm. even though i had them clipped really short and he he got so mad at me he said ruben you know you fool if you would just told me two hours ago we would have saved all you had to do was lace your your uh you know you, your shoes a little tighter and then your foot doesn't slip and hit the the so little things make a big difference, right? Yeah. yeah. So that was killing. Uh, 
um, uh, kill, uh, and then the Hemingway, uh, he was responsible for Pamplona too, you know, because he he wrote about about Pamplona in one of his books. And back oh in the nineties, uh, one of my best buddies in the loose circuit was from Spain, and we always talked about we're going to go wrong with the Bulls. Yeah. And he's too busy. He's, he he runs all these huge companies now. He can't get out. And so I went with Greg, and we went and we. But before I went. Right. I, I read three books about Pamplona. I actually called one of the authors who'd run it about 30 times over the years. And I wanted some coaching. I said, hey, I want the experience, but I don't want any extra holes in my body. So what do I do? Yeah. And he says, well, don't stand in the beginning. It's too fast. You'll die. All right, great. OK, don't stand in the middle. It's this curve. You'll get squashed. Great. <laughs> Got it. Don't stand at the end. Great. Got it. Because what you do is you stand 50 yards past the curve on the uh, on the right side. And the bulls, if they if they read the script right, the bulls will come by you about three meters on your left and you'll have the experience without any problems. Right. But he said, um, but there's no you know, there's there's no guarantees because if one bull gets split, then he becomes territorial. As long as they're together, they're a herding animal. They're cool. But if one gets split, he's he's after everybody. And he said, watch out for everybody else because the, the the drunks are worse than the bulls. <laughs> Everybody's got <laughs> courage over there. But we did it. See, uh, I'm actually sometimes I speak on uh, risk management and I tell them these stories. I tell them, look, you can do risky things, scary things, as long as you do your due diligence and talk to somebody who's already done it. Because uh, what you don't know can hurt you, right? <laughs> and, yeah. And so, uh, you know. Get your coaching down, and that yeah, that sounds like a massive part of your of your experiences is not so much just the actual experience, but it's the lead up for it. And it's the modeling that you do of these people. That seems to be the the method that you use. Pick the person, and away you go. That's it. I mean, I, I tell people, look, all you got to success is simple. I mean, just find somebody that's already done what you want to do, and then ask for help, ask for some tips. You're not wasting their time because, see, they've reached success, but now they're after something bigger. They're after significance, right? Mm -hmm. And if you start making your dream come true because they helped you, then they created a ripple effect, and that's significance. So just as long as you're going to do what they say, right? If you're going to be an eternal learner, forget it. Don't waste your time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And is that approach then something that you do um, just off the cuff? Do you do? I mean, for people that that hear that, everyone sort of says, "Get a mentor, get a model, have someone." But the, that first step for some people can be really scary in terms of how do I how do I reach out? Is it just be normal? Go I'll ask. How do you do it? I call them up. I just call them up. You know, uh, and, and I t- teach my kids to do the same thing. You know, we'll we'll we're reading a book. Uh, with my kids and they like it, I said, you really like it? Well, let's call the author. Let's say hello to him, right? Yeah. And let him know. He'll feel so good that you liked it. And and what I'm teaching them is that uh, people are people, right? Uh, nobody's bigger than you or greater than you. They're just further along than you, right? And they'll be happy to show you the way. And so uh, it's just a head thing. You know, I, I think you can call anybody. Yeah, for sure. That's that's great. Great advice for everyone that, that's out there maybe thinking about that or saying that I'm not enough to go. Who am I to go and speak to this person? Who am I to be shown whatever it is I need to learn by someone else? I've got to put in my time. But I think that's really valuable. The, the, the other thing I think is valuable, and this is the other sort of second part of what I think you you stand for, is the work of visualization. So you have the model, you sit there, and, and, and your journey to the Olympics is a great one. But the part that visualization played in that and how that helped you to become unstoppable on that quest to, to make the Olympics, not only once, but now four and hopefully five times. Yeah, you know, uh, I always, you know, I, I might have been walking down the street, I might have been eating dinner, uh, you know, uh, walking down the mall, jogging. But, you know, in my mind, I could see myself walking to the, the opening ceremonies. And I could see all the people cheering. It was so exciting, right? And I look over to the to the right and, wow, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a flag and there's those rings. Wow, we're here. And we're high-fiving each other. And, and, and you can see the torch and, the, and you can hear the, 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 uh, the, the band playing the Olympic anthem. And you can feel the goosebumps and, you know, and, and the tears of joy, right? Because everybody's mm-hmm. so happy. And I tell you, man, I, I feel it right now I'm telling you. I've got, I got the goosebumps now. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you go through that little exercise, what's it going to feel like? What's it going to taste like? What's it going to be like? Getting all those senses in, getting the passion in, right? You can't be cool and collected. You got to get into it, right? The emotion. Then your subconscious mind, it can't tell the difference between something that you vividly imagine with all your heart and all your soul and all your passion. Can't tell the difference between that, between that and something that's actually happening. So you go through that little exercise, you're getting stronger inside and you believe starts coming through and your courage and all of a sudden, 
you become a better leader at work because everybody wants to follow somebody that, that believes. And, and all of a sudden, you start attracting resources that were there before, but they weren't coming to you before because why? Everybody wants to help a winner. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to help somebody that believes. And it all starts with that, you know, what you're telling yourself and, and how excited you get about it. And then what's that like? Well, you get to the Olympics and you've just talked about with so much passion the, the opening ceremony and making that goal. Then there's the actual performance of what you do and then people get hooked up on results. It, what's, the <sighs> Olympic, what's the Olympics really about? Well, you know, it, it, it's just a place that showcases to the world the, the power of the human spirit, you know? The, the, the fact that, that if you've got a dream and, and you want it badly enough and you're willing, willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes, okay, no quitting allowed, then dreams do come true. They do. And, and even if they don't, right, top 40 got to go to the Olympics, okay? Actually, top 37 are getting to go to the Olympics now. They keep making it harder and harder. Mm. Well, what about number 38? He missed it by a hundredth of a second on one race, you know, bad day, right? And now he's watching it on TV. Well, that guy's going to feel awful inside, but he had to dig so deep inside, right, to go for it, to to pursue that dream that he's found God-given gifts he didn't know he had before, right? And now he's got those forever. So you, so chasing the dream is not about the dream. The dream's just the carrot. It's about the person you become, right? Yep. And so I, I tell people, don't ever let some small-minded person tell you that you're being selfish for chasing your dream because, no, they're being selfish by – sitting on the couch watching TV all day, right? I mean, uh, what, go for your dream. You'll be a better person. You can impact the world better. Yeah. So Yeah, for sure. So it's about the human spirit. It's about the human spirit. You mentioned the medals. It's funny. Sometimes we'll do a Q&A after a, after a talk, and somebody will always ask, did you win the medal, right? And <laughs> yeah, believe me, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a threat to any of the top luge guys, okay? They're not worried about me. <laughs> I get to play with big boys, but I'm in a different. It was like in the old days. It was Martina Navratilova and everybody else, right? Yeah, yeah. Same thing. And so um, there's a guy back in the old days. It was Pablo, my friend from Spain. He was always about five spots in front of me. So if I beat Pablo, man, I just won my gold medal, right? Pablo's going after this Swede that's always about five in front of him. The Swede's going after this Czech guy. The Czech guy's going after an Italian. Italian's going after that medal, right? And so there's all these races or your personal races, but the only one that the spectators care about is the one with the medals. Yeah, that's true. But I also think then personally for you and and in your experience, if I read it right, then you can have a medal that sits on a wall or on a shelf and it looks nice and you can go there to access that place. But if you've got the mindset and what you've put in the work that you've put in mentally to get there and you've taken that on board for every step of the way, then you can access those great feelings no matter what it is. You don't need that that medal on the wall. You don't need that certificate. You've got that built in. Absolutely. Uh, You said that. You said that so purdy. (laughs) <laughs> thank you <laughs> you but got a gift man you do but i think it's you true really podcasts <laughs> and i love doing it that's that's the whole point if someone listens great but for me it's like this experience i'm talking to you it's 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 all that stuff you know what i mean it's you've got to build a yeah, win you and i won it's a matter of uh yeah. if, if those listeners are going to win too right that's right you got to build it so you can win no matter what happens absolutely all right, let, now we're talking on this topic, and I could talk to you for days about this stuff, but <laughs> out of all these experiences, you are also written best-selling books. One of them is The Courage to Succeed. You're a lifelong student of this stuff and success, which is why I can get into this so deep and so so quick with you. If I had to, if you had to sum that up, because I do want to move on to teams and a bit more um, about collaboration and things, but what's one quality you think that all successful people have? I think it's perseverance. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I... Ever since uh, I was about 12 years old, uh, my dad got me to read biographies. He said, if you'll study the lives of great people, you'll figure out what works and what doesn't work because uh, success leaves clues. Mm -hmm. And I started reading biographies, and I loved them. And they were all the same story. It was also the story of somebody had a dream, then they had a struggle, and they had a victory, right? And if they were perseverant enough to get through that struggle, you know, if you stay in the game long enough, you got to stay in the game long enough to learn some skills, Right. And to find those mentors and those coaches that, that, that'll that help you. but uh, And then use those skills to reach the dream. But if you quit, you know, no way. You know, and I tell my kids, I've told them ever since they were six years old, I've told them life is tough, okay? So we got to be tougher. Life's going to knock you on your knees. You're going to have some bloody knees. But guess what? We pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and get back in the fight, right? 
and they understand. And by telling them that, uh, they put on mental armor, right? And now they're ready for that fight, mm. right? If you tell them, oh, it's going to be easy. You're a winner, baby. You can do it. Oh, here's your ribbon for 25th place. Man, as soon as they, they, they get a splinter, they're going to quit on you, right? <laughs> so you got so you to, you know, it's tough love. You got to let them know, Yeah. Okay? which is really good love. You tell them what, what's, what they're going to encounter. Yeah, I have to. It's a persevere. Yeah, well, that's, and that goes back to that difference. That's the difference between having it internally or needing to see validation on the wall. That's, that's part yeah. of that difference. Now you've said it, the biographies and how important they are to you. What's the? Give me the top three biographies that had the biggest impact on you. For me, it was always uh, people that had to overcome great odds, right? The Helen Kellers, mm -hmm. the uh, Mother Teresas, the uh, Martin Luther Kings, the uh, uh, Patton. I love Patton. Oh my gosh! And Edison. Golly, everybody's laughing at him, right? Yeah. Hey, hey, you failed ten thousand times. No, I know ten thousand things that don't work. <laughs> I mean, what an attitude. He was protecting his attitude, and that you know you have to protect your attitude because it's fragile. And uh, so I, I love those. I mean, um, Patton. Oh my gosh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Patton is, "If you're going through hell, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I mean, that's that's smart. right. <laughs> Get through that. Yeah, and so important. It comes back to that perseverance. Yeah, so important. Yep. It's so much to learn. I mean, people. It's so, it's so easy to pick up a book and learn, and and just learn from the clues that people, the successful people, leave behind. Yeah, you don't even have to pay for them. You can get them at the library. But, That's right. You know, you, know what, you know what people at the library are doing? They're playing games on the computer. Yeah. None of them is reading. That's... What, a, what, a, what, a, what a waste of opportunity. All right, let's change it up a bit. One of the things we've talked about, we've talked about luge. One of the things you've also done then in your college days, going back a little ways, was play, um, was play soccer, football, whoever, whichever, whichever yeah. side of the world you're on. But you played that, and that's a team sport. So now you're in luge, that's a single sport. And this is where sort of the teams and collaboration stuff starts to happen. A lot of people talk about the difference in personality traits. So oh, this guy would be good at tennis because he's got that personality. This guy would be great in a team sport because he's got that personality. Having done both, and this is why it's so great mm. to have you on the show for me personally, how do you see the difference? Is there a difference? Is there an overlap? How do you view that, having had the experience of playing team and single sports? You know, I see them both as team sports, number one. Um, and e even before I... I I got to know about you and we decided to do this. Uh, I, I've written in my books, you know, how one of my chapters called how I turned singles luge into a team sport. Right. Mm. <laughs> well, when I played soccer, uh, football in college, uh, I, I tried out and two weeks after the tryout coach said, uh, come to my office. He says, obviously you're not that great. Uh, you had an incredible day that tryout day, but you're a slow poke. You're holding us back. He said, you're a threat to our own team. That's what he said. He was oh, a real wow. motivator. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> feedback for you. <laughs> oh, man. He said, the, uh, the, um, you're too slow. And, and he says, the only, you get to play when we're winning by two goals. That's, that's the new rule around here. And so I realized right away, you know, and I wasn't even sad. You know, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm still so happy to be part of the team. that um, Because it was a real team. It was an NCAA Division I. That's the highest collegiate level. So, I was, man, that was a big deal. Uh, but I realized, obviously, I'm not too uh, valuable on the field. I better become valuable off the field or else I'm going to get kicked out, right? And so on my own, I started mowing the lawn in the, in the field, right? That Boy, really? that took forever. Drawing the lines, uh, washing the soccer balls. I figured if this guy cuts me, he's going to have to hire three guys to replace me, right? Yeah. And I was the cheerleader. And I, I, I mean, I, was, I, I would make these big – I was the marketer for the team. I mean, I would put posters all over the school with pictures and, and uh, you know, to try to get people in the stands. And I'm sitting there. You know, I'm playing two, five, two to five minutes a game, right? But I wanted the team to win. And I, I was always on the traveling squad. And I don't know if he brought, kept me in the team, you know, let me travel with the team because I was motivating them. Uh, I was a big cheerleader. But get, get this. I, I was really into photography back then. I, I would take these pictures of all, all my teammates playing, right? And they were really good. And this guy from the yearbook comes up to me one day in the middle of a game. He goes, hey, as long as you've got that camera, why don't you just take the pictures of the yearbook? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I was, you know, I was kind of a support guy, right? And I got to play a little bit, but uh, I actually hurt my teammates a few times in practice, uh, where they had to go and get stitches because I, you know, I was playing too hard because I wanted it, but I just didn't have the gifts. And so I took that, you know, when I went into luge, I took 
that attitude as well, right? Where can I help? How can I? I figure if I'm if I can be real helpful to other people, then maybe they'll be helpful to me. And when we when I remember when we traveled abroad, uh, duct tape was really expensive in Europe. Uh, this is back in the 90s. Yeah. So I decided, okay, I'll be the duct tape guy. And I would bring an extra bag, bag that was just full of duct tape, and I'd give it to everybody. And they were, they were so happy, right? Yeah. And so, um, and then later on, we went into the International Luge Federation team, which you can see, the vid- you saw the video on the, on the website. And we're, we're tight, right? And we're tight because we understand at a real deep gut level that, hey, <laughs> uh, we, unless we stay together and we help each other out, we don't have a prayer against the huge teams with a big, big, you know, the, the Manchester United's, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. we're, we're Tanzania football, right? <laughs> <laughs> or Cameroon. Cameroon. Right? That's and, right. Yeah, so we don't have a chance unless we stick together and so we help each other out. And, and you saw it on the video. I mean, even right before the Olymp- right during the Olympics, we're all uh, helping each other out with, with, with suits. Uh, speed suits because one guy unfortunately had Adidas on his, and yep. so we just swapped around so he could race too. Yeah, and I want to really dive into that because this idea to me is—it's it, it, not foreign. I, I love it, but at the same time, it's just not something you'd expect. So, can you just just pull back a step and and just talk to us about that idea of? For me, it's all about collaboration versus competition. I mean, on one hand, everyone's focused on the competition. We're here to compete. We've got to win. We've got to do our best. Yes, that's fine. But then there's a there's an opposite side of that, which is collaboration and how we can actually get better together and we still get those results that we talked about earlier in the show. So w- w- just explain to everyone how that works and what this Luge Federation team is all about and how you guys operate when you're when you're out when you're out and about. Sure. Uh, the first four years that I did the luge from 84 to 88, I was under the U.S. team, the U.S. Uh, you know, since I went to Lake Placid uh, at first, they wouldn't take me They said you're too old. No way. When he found out I was from Argentina, he did a 180. He said, if you'll go for Argentina, we'll help you, okay? We'll train you. We'll, we'll, you'll travel with us. And they figured we'll teach him enough where he's not a threat to the U.S. team, but he can qualify, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, the, the luge was always in danger of getting kicked out of the Olympics because there's not enough countries. It's not global enough, right? And so I, w- I was the first country from South America. Right? So they were happy. I said, we got a whole new continent now, okay, IOC? And so that's, that's how it went. And then uh, right after, right during the, um, uh, the Calgary Olympics in 88, Pablo, my Spanish friend, he says, hey, Ruben, we've got to meet this guy. And, and so we went and we met this guy, this Austrian guy. His name was Gunter. He had been a three-time world champion in doubles luge. And the International Luge Federation, which governs the sport, uh, they got smart. They said, we're going to put together a development team, put a top coach, get a couple of vans, and, and see if we can get more countries started so that we don't get kicked out of the Olympics, right? right. And so we started learning under, under Gunter. And, and uh, so we were a bunch of guys, Virgin Islands and Norway and Argentina and, uh, I mean, little tiny countries. Uh, but uh, so we realized, you know, number one, we got to do whatever coach says, and we better help each other out. Maximum, right? Mm. But even so, we're not soft, okay? This collaboration thing doesn't mean it's soft. We're soft. Uh, and I guess the, the, the best way I can explain it to you is when we were trying to get qualify for the Salt Lake City Olympics, which is 2002, uh, and, and I'm always in the bottom, okay? I'm, I'm always like, we're all scratching and clawing for those last few spots, and my brother was there too. I had already competed in two Olympics. I got him into the, the sport and I, I thought, okay, well, I hope we both make it. But if my thinking was, if one of us makes it, it's going to be me. Okay. Even though I'd rather have three and you zero than me two and, and you one. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, I'll collaborate, but I'm still, I'm still going to do the best I can. Right. And, uh, and and he made it. Luckily, he made it. By and, and uh, we but we made Olympic history. It's the first time two brothers compete against each other in the Olympics. Yeah. But um, but yeah. So I'll help him. But on race day, uh, you know, I'm really competing against myself. I really am. In the luge, it's who can have. You know, you got you got to have a uh, your best run to have a shot, right? And so you're trying. And so there's these the same thing. You know, I'm I'm trying. There's these guys that I'm always trying to beat, and 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 they have their goal, and and so on. Yeah, and that that plays out. I mean, there's another video on the website that I wanted to talk about then, and that's the one. And I, thought, it's it's sort of in a way, it's a silly video, but it, it, there's something to it, I think. And that's the one where you're passing around this apple. 
<laughs> and you guys, are, yeah, it, it just goes to show. I mean, that's it, explain it to people that are listening. And again, what, what, how that comes about and how it, how it contrasts with this idea that, um, that it's, it's life and death and all mind games in the locker room. Yeah. Um, and is it all right if I tell them the, the website uh, for that, for oh, that, uh, course, play that find that? yeah, I'll put yeah, it in okay, the show it's... notes, but, um, yeah, please, oh, okay. please put it out there. Yeah. That one page, that one page I have, a, a it's called your greatest team ever.com. You're in, and it's just a URL that I got to point to that page, your greatest team ever. Beautiful. Uh, but this little video up at the top and, and this happened right at the, uh, it, this was at the Vancouver Olympics up at the men's start house and we're getting ready to train and we got there. And when you, next time you watch the video, you're going to see this guy on his knees doing stretches way in the back. And he's just looking at us. This guy's Armin Ziegler, multi uh, gold medal winner, probably one of the top two or three uh, luge guys in history, right? Yeah. And he's just looking at us, probably wondering, what are these fools <laughs> doing with that apple? <laughs> but this was not choreographed. It just happened, okay? Yeah. We, we, I don't think we could replicate this, especially when, the, uh, when, when Petter comes by and kicks it. But uh, one of the guys took a bite out of an apple, and rather than keep it, he just tossed it across, and it was just natural. The next guy, he took a bite, and he passed it, and just kept going back and forth about, I don't know, six times. And then Peter from Bulgaria, it's Peter, but we call him Peter, that's how you say it. Yep. He's walking by, and you hear him, everybody say, hey, Peter, Peter. And, but he doesn't know what we're doing, and they toss it to him, and he's a soccer player. He just kicks it, right? Just a little <laughs> backflip. <laughs> but it was so perfect because it illustrates that we're, we're gelled. We're a bunch of guys that, uh, you know, we speak different languages. Sometimes we have trouble, you know, talking to each other, uh, but, but we're one in, in heart. That's right. And and you can help each other without um what do I want to say? You can help each other without impacting or to the detriment of your own performance. It's not what you can take out of everything and everyone that you're coming into contact with. And if there's anything out of your story and what we've talked about so far, it's definitely not the case that it's all about how can I take advantage of all these little pieces just for me? There's something that goes back into that. I think that's critical. Yeah, you can help each other out and it's it's uh Everybody out there is better than me at something, yeah. Right, so 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 I can learn from anybody. That's right, and we, and the more we do that, I think the better off the better off we are. the The other way I think it plays out is in terms of feedback. I mean, how do you take take it this way for you to debrief yourself after a run on the luge? I mean, it goes past in a blink of an eye; it's all a blur. How do you how do you possibly give yourself honest feedback if you're doing it all by yourself? <laughs> and so, typically, what we do is we we take the run. We get to the bottom. There's a walkie-talkie. There's a bunch of walkie-talkies down at the bottom because there's coaches up and down the track. And we usually have two two coaches, sometimes three, and they'll stand where we're having problems, right, or where we're having challenges. And so we pick up the walkie-talkie, and they, you know, hey, Ruben, you must relax, right? You didn't put your toes. Put your head for the back. I mean, oh, okay, thanks, coach, you know. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> and so, uh, so he told me what to do. Then if I have time, if there's enough people training where, where you have time to – you take a, a truck back to the top, uh, to the men's to the start house, mm-hmm. get into your parka and, and haul down to where the coach is. Now you can watch some of the Italians, some of the Germans, some of the U.S. guys going where you just went, right? And he said, see, you, you started steering here. You need to steer two feet further. I'm thinking two feet further. Give me a break. I was going 80 miles an hour. I don't know what that means. <laughs> that's that's but, a blink of an eye, not even <laughs> – for him, three-time world champion, he's, he, he's got a different mentality. But but now i got a visual, right? And um, and then the worst part of it, and we do that three, well, about six times in a day. We take five or six runs in a day. And that's why visualization is so important because, you know, how are you going to get good on, on, on five runs? Yeah. You have to visualize. And you don't just visualize the perfect run, okay? This is very important. You visualize, what am I going to do if I'm late into curve one? What, how am I going to fix that? What am I going to do if I'm early into curve one? Okay, now I got uh, so I got three options for every curve. So those are contingency plans. And if you get to the point where you know that you got a plan for everything, that helps your confidence, right? Yeah. Now you got you're ready for anything that track can give you, and it can throw at you, right? And so so we do that. And then the worst part of the day is in the evening because we all got to get together and watch the videos because they shot videos of us going by. <laughs> now we see how lousy we are. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So it's incremental. Every day, you know, you're learning, 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 and trying to make it better. We try not to spend more than two weeks in any one track because your mind gets bored. It gets tired, right? Mm. And so if you, you get bored, you start making mistakes, you get hurt, you plateau. So you go to a different track, and so you're getting challenged in a different way. And it's constantly changing. And we're walking down the track, and coach might say, okay, see this curve? This is like Sarajevo Curve 8, okay? See the entrance? Oh, yeah, we got it, okay. And now see that curve? That's like uh, Altenburg Curve 9. Okay, yeah, I got it, right? And so eventually you start piecing things from different curves and learning. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like when Formula One drivers, you know, they walk the track too, you know, they just do. You got to make a plan. Yeah, and I love that idea about having the contingencies because flexibility is key. I mean, you talk about, I think one of the biggest things we've got to all do is in our groups and in our teams is to become more flexible and get better at dealing with the uncertainties. And one of the ways to do that is to to plan these things out and not, not kid yourself that things aren't going to happen. Things are going to, challenges are going to pop up. Unexpected things are going to happen. You've got to, you've got to be prepared for those as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now you're trying to qualify for your fifth Winter Olympics in 2022. <laughs> this is how I sort of came across you on Instagram and we sort of just started talking, which was which was brilliant. The interesting thing for me is, and you can tell me this story and all about the, the trying to qualify for the fifth. The question I've got is, how's your training or your mindset changed over the years? Have you noticed anything that shifted as you've gone on? Yeah, I can tell that uh, I'm definitely mentally tougher now, mentally stronger. Um, I can uh, put an idea in my mind and a thought, and I'm going to do this and actually do it, right? I'm actually uh, starting to listen to the coaches more, right? Which is, I been doing, I've been, I'm a hard head, okay? I really am, and very independent-minded, and so I've always had trouble with that, right? I don't like people telling me what to do, <laughs> and, and it's hurt me. And now it's, hey, I'm 55 going to, against a bunch of guys. Most of them weren't even born when I was competing in the first Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have this back to the wall uh, feeling now that, okay, I, I, better, I better listen to everybody now. And I found when I went to Calgary uh, about a month ago, uh, after a seven-year break, I went and took some runs and I was doing better than ever. And I realized that it's because I'm listening to their, what they say and I'm, I'm, I'm applying instantly what they say. Right? I'm becoming more coachable. Yep. And, and, and they said, but you're, you, you're starting to do that, Ruben, okay? <laughs> you're not there yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> after every run, there's this one spot in the Calgary track where I would mess up. I'd come out of the, the curve eight fine, but there's this 100-yard long straightaway, and I would, uh, I'd get nervous and mess up. And it says, Ruben, you have to trust. You have to trust, right? So it's almost like ninja. Yeah. You know, it's like be worked with the sled, right? But <laughs> trust yourself. Just relax and let it run. And I'm scared. And I tighten up and it goes into a skid and I mess up. And so I have to tr work on trusting me and I have to work on trusting the coaches too. And I'm, I think I'm trusting the coaches more than I'm trusting myself. Um, it's funny. I, I read a biography of uh, Tiger Woods years ago, maybe 15 years ago. But he talks about – I remember him talking about how he, when he's putting, especially, he says uh, he's tell, telling himself, trust, trust yourself, Tiger. Trust. You know what to do. Just yeah. do it. Trust yourself. Yeah. Let go. So, so important. I need to go. I got to become a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and what then on the back of that, then what are the three things? Trust can be one and, and so important. But what are the three things as you start to plan and prepare for this massive journey that – that that's unprecedented what are the three things you know that you absolutely must do to get yourself there well um coaches are saying uh number one you got to work on flexibility right uh i drive pretty well i'm a pretty good driver uh on the sled once i in the luge it's kind of like you always hear about the biathlon where um you you have to you're going you know 100 miles an hour on skis and then you have to lower your you know relax and get your heart rate down so you can shoot well the luge is very, very similar because the start of the luge is a very explosive movement you're you're pulling out and with your whole body with it and, and then you're paddling furiously and then you have to easily uh settle into the sled and relax and breathe and all of a sudden it's you have you know you have to relax even if your breathing is wrong if you hold your breath down the luge run, which is easy to do because you're scared to death, <laughs> you're automatically a half a second slower. And so we, we're taught to exhale at the entrance and exit of every curve to help us relax, right? And so uh, they said, you're a pretty good driver. You're, you're, you're a bull. You're, you're, your initial pull is strong, right? So you're good there. 
but your paddles, you look like a grandma when you're paddling. You look like a little old, <laughs> little girl. <laughs> not, you know, none of your arm strength is even uh, going into the ice, and you're, uh, and you're not speeding yourself up. And so that's where you have the most to gain. And so in order to do that, you have to be able to your, – your hips are too tight from sitting in that desk. Uh, so you have to open up those hips. And it's going to take months. might take about a year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a series of exercises. And your upper, uh, your upper thoracic, right, because uh, uh, bent over, over the computer, same thing. It needs to, i got to get that arch back so that I can uh, – when I'm paddling, my chest is all the way down and staying down as I'm applying this force. And now I'll be able to accelerate and have a uh, – by the time I'm laying down, I'm going at a faster speed. And uh, the first split, which is usually about five seconds, the first, yeah. which is your start time, um, if you're a tenth of a second faster in your start time, it rule of thumb is you're going to be three tenths faster. It's a three to one in your whole time Overall. because wow. you have yeah, because you have a higher velocity entering the rest of the track. And so, uh, and I've always had the worst start of all. And I think that I'm going to have a, in 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 Beijing, um, uh, in at at the age of 59. I believe, I mean, I, I'm, I'm positive that my starts are going to be stronger than when I was 25 in the Calgary Olympics right. because I'm differently now and yeah. I'm stronger here and I'm hungrier. People that do want to follow you, again, I'll put it in the show notes, but where, the best way to follow this journey and, and to sort of stay in touch with you is, is through Instagram? Yeah, I think so because from Instagram, they can go to the website and see. Of know, course. Click yeah, oldest Olympian. That's a but. But yeah, if you go to Instagram, the Luge Man, uh, that's the easiest way because I'm I'm gonna be posting cool stuff. Yeah, it is, and it is very cool. I love it. I love seeing it every time one comes up. It's always always good quality. All right, oh, let's let's um let's sort of start to 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 round this home. I want to touch on then what do you do outside of Olympic years? You don't compete on the World Cup stage. I'd take it. Um, you you've had some big breaks in between. You said seven years recently, but. You've had a couple of those seven-year breaks, yep. a apart from running with the bulls and doing all the crazy stuff in between. How <laughs> else do you fun. fill? How else do you fill in your time? What is, what is it that keeps you busy when you're not doing that? Well, um, I used to sell copiers in Houston. I door to door, hitting on you know, calling on offices in downtown Houston. Yeah. And about a month before the Salt Lake City Olympics, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, this little kid in my neighborhood said, "Hey, Ruben, when you come back from." From the Olympics, will you be my show and tell project in school? <laughs> and I thought, sure, why not, right? And I pictured, you know, it's show and tell day. Everybody's showing something off. I'm in and out of there in five minutes, right? But I'm going to win show and tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally going to get my medal. I brought the sled. I brought the, the Olympic torch because I was a torch bearer. I thought, no prisoners. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> I go up there. I'm so happy. I'm excited, you know. The principal takes me to the auditorium. There's 200 kids sitting there. He says, you got 45 minutes. Have at them. They turn it into an assembly, but they didn't tell me. Yeah, and I almost died. I thought, I'm gonna. What do I do, right? <laughs> and I actually said a prayer. I said, God, what do I do now? And what I felt I needed to do was just tell them your story and give them some pointers to help them reach their goals and dreams. Yeah. And I did. And afterwards, the principal gets in my face. And he starts shouting at me like he's mad. He says, "You got a gift. You're better than the people we pay. You need to do this for a living." I said, what, you get paid for show and tell? And he said, no, it's a speaking profession. Don't you know anything? So three days later, I quit my job. I figured if I can sell a copy or I can sell a Reuben too. And I just started calling schools. First year and a half, I spoke at schools. And then um, I, I, after about six months, I was broke, right? Because I forgot that summer, you know, school. There was no school. No nope. yeah. So um, I, I got a mentor, a, a guy that had already been in the business for, for uh, gosh, 12 years at the time. He lived in the house that I wanted to live in. He was driving the car that I wanted to drive. He had fruit on the trees, right? You don't go looking for a theorist. You look for somebody who's done it. And he said, Ruben, first thing, you know, I don't care if you're a 10-time Olympian. Unless you write a book, no one's going to take you seriously because an author is considered the, the, the authority of his subject. He wrote the book on it. It'll open up doors. Well, I can't write a book. I made C's in English. He says, well, you got a great story. You give it to some A student, so they clean it up for you. That's just grammar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow, think about that. And he says, well, that, that's called editing, okay? So shut up and sit down. I mean, it was like that. He was just beating me on the head because I'm such a hard head. I need a tough, mean coach all the time. Uh -huh. But um, that book made a whole difference, you know? I mean, it's been translated to over 10 languages. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got to speak in Poland, 
uh, this guy read my Polish version of my book. I didn't know I had a Polish version. <laughs> we were having a leadership conference in Warsaw. So we took the whole family to Warsaw for a week, and then we went to Spain for a week uh, just because I listened to my mentor, right? Yeah. And so I do a lot of writing, and I still i am on the phone, man. I, I love the hunt. I mean, I, I enjoy sharing, right? Like I'm sharing now and sharing from stage. Mm. But I tell you, uh, I love hunting. I love making those phone calls because when you get one, oh my gosh, it feels like you just got Moby Dick. The right? feeling's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's such a cool story. I love that. So you, you're out and yeah. about, you're out about writing and speaking. That's so cool. Let's, yeah. let's then bring it full circle then. All right. One more question before we, before we look at the top 10. Back when you started this journey, let's go back all the way to that, that, um, that moment when you said, right, I want to go to the Olympics. What you had in your mind and what you thought it would be to where it's taken you and what's happened. Is there any way that you can summarize how you feel about that? Could, could you ever have imagined what's happened in the years since? No way. No way. I mean, I think my whole life has been a God thing. I mean, a uh, lousy athlete gets to go to the Olympics over and over and over again. And uh, uh, terrible grammar, can't write, best-selling author. Shy guy. Believe it or not, I'm shy, okay? I get excited when I'm talking about this, but I'm a, I'm a wallflower. Uh, I'm very introverted, believe it or not. Uh, and, and I make my living speaking to hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. It's, it's nuts, right? Uh, but I think part of the reason is whenever there's been an open, I, I run to daylight, okay? Whenever I see an opening, I will just barge through there like, a, like, like, like the guy's carrying the football is trying to get through that hole so he can you know, gain some yardage. That's what I do. Uh, I don't wait till everything's perfect. And, and I, part of this I'll learn on my own, but my, my speaker coach said, hey, Ruben, we're just going to throw mud on the wall. Some of it's going to stick, and, and uh, we'll clean up the mess later, okay? But, uh, you know, perfectionists don't ever get anything done. And so, you know, just, we'll just work our tails off and see what happens. Yeah. So that's what I do. You know, and, I, and sometimes I talk, it's so hard to transition from, you know, from, from, what we do is not professional athletics, but it's that same level, right? Transition from that to, to real life that, uh, you know, there's a, you don't have that fight, you know, that, that, that competition, the level of people that you're, you know, when I'm training in the field team, these are all kids in their 20s, but they're so focused and they want it so badly and, it, and they have such high standards that you get used to being in, a, in an environment full of people with high standards and it's harder to find, right? Yep. And so that's why I have this seven-year itch. After seven years, I, 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 it's like I've got to have some more of that. Yeah. And, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get myself around those guys again. And so uh, <laughs> it's opened up doors, but I've taken advantage of the opportunities. And, and I wish more people would. I mean, I've talked to other athletes, ex-athletes, and talked to them about life after sports, right? I tell them, look, the things you've learned, right? You're, you're selling yourself short because the things you've learned and the things that you've experienced about, you know, you know more about leadership and teamwork and, and, and drive and, and success than, than a lot of people in, that have MBAs because you lived it. And so you can translate those principles and, and, and teach people in business how to do it. And they're not doing it, right? They're blowing it. And uh, they don't treat their life like, like it's an Olympic sport and, and you need to. Yeah, that's so, that's so critical. I, we haven't even talked about standards, but that to me is, I mean, that's what separates, I think, everything we've talked about. This whole th conversation has been a conversation about standards. There's a line that a certain standard will get you a certain result. And a higher standard will get you a higher result. It's not. It's not rocket science like that, is it? It's. It's just that's. But that's. That's as simple as it can be. Raise your standards. Yeah, and I got to meet for a couple of minutes. I got to meet uh, Evander Holyfield one time, and this is while I was training for my first Olympics. And and I didn't know the story about him, but Greg Greg Reed actually interviewed him years later, and then he tells this story where he says, um, you know, how, how did you do it? I mean, you're, you're older than everybody else, and you're just chiseled. You're in such great shape, and you're so sharp still. And, and, and his answer was, because I hold myself to a higher standard than anybody else, and that's why I'm able to produce at a higher level than anybody else. I thought, whoa, that's so much truth there. Yeah, that's so simple, but that's something to live by. If you live like that, then, hey, the Olympics, yeah. the Olympics, it can, be, the Olympics can be real. Yeah, yeah, every day. That's so cool. 
All right, Ruben, I'm, I am watching the time here. As I said, I could talk to you for days on this stuff and I'd be happy to have you back along this journey and, and, and talk more about this at a later date. But I think, um, sure. I, I, think okay. I might let you, let you go. But before I do, Barn Raiser's top 10, the top 10 questions I ask everyone at the end of an episode. Are we up for doing some, some top 10? Uh, let's, let's do it. All right, let's see how we go. I'm really interested to hear how you answer some of these questions. This will be really cool. Let me ask you a question first. Uh, you've interviewed a lot of people and you've asked them these questions. Do you see a lot of the same uh, answers or are they all over the place? You know what? I don't. I don't see the same answers a lot of the time. No. I. I in fact, I, I'd struggle to say that there's people that have answered the same thing more than twice out of people. That really? Oh, oh, I've seen, I would have thought, oh, okay, well. And that to me makes it really they're... exciting. I mean, it's it's different because I never know what people are yeah. going to say. And sometimes they have the same as what I think. And it's like, oh, okay, I have, that's the same answer as mine. But certainly not everyone. Yeah. Um, interesting. And, Very interesting. Yeah, it is. I, I think it comes out of, though, the fact that people's idea about teamwork, and I say this all the time when I'm training, is how you learn about teams was different to how the next person learns about teams. And we never really get taught how to work together in, in any sort of sense. It's sort of like a whole bunch of experiences we get thrown together. Now, your experience on the soccer team could have been an awful one when that coach said what he said. But then yeah. again, that experience... I was just happy to be part of the guys. I just want to be with the guys. Exactly. So then your, <laughs> your idea about working together is one thing. You take the other kid who was devastated by the coach's news and thinks, well, teamwork sucks, it's not for me. Their belief then that they carry forward for the, the rest of their life is going to be shaped by that one experience because we never go back and learn. So I think that's where it's like coming out of the start gate in the luge. You come out of the start gate and that velocity builds. I think when you have your experiences with teamwork, that that happens. But there's no other grabbing point that people get along the way. They don't get to start again. They just keep going. And that's part of the work I do is trying to teach people about this stuff and get them to understand that, hey, it's a skill. It's not a character trait. Right. You're not hardwired for teamwork. You, it's something that you can learn. It's something you can build upon. It's a skill like anything else. Let's not make it into this thing where, well, I haven't got it, so therefore that's just who I am. That's right, right, that's right. crap to me. So yeah, that's part exactly. of my message. So I think that's, that's why we get these sort of different answers, and that's why I love asking these questions because I never know what's going to cool. come up. Okay, good. Question number one. What is the one thing you feel must be present or created for a team to succeed? You know, I think... I think a teammates and you, you have to trust each other. You have to trust the coach too. You know, if, if I trust my coach and, and they've got the fruit on the trees that we talked about before, I'll do whatever they say. Right. Mm. Uh, I, I'm like the soldier that just wants a really good general to follow. Right. Tell me which hill to take and I'll, I'll take it. Right. And then amongst the teammates, that's important too. And, and you got to have a, a, a good compelling goal, right. That excites everybody. Right. And for us was, uh, was, you know, making it to the Olympics. How many of us can we get in here, right? If we can get us all, that would be so sweet. Yeah. We'll, we'll have more fun, all, all, all the buddies together at the Olympics. Well, you know, one of the guys didn't make it, but most of us did. And so a uh, compelling vision or goal, but you got to trust each other, right? Beautiful. And you care for each other. It's like a family. All right, number two, what is one thing you feel must be avoided or overcome in order for a team to succeed? Well, uh, I think that, if we had somebody in and, and you know what, there, there, there's another team that I was a part of. I forgot to talk about it, but do they have Chick-fil-A's Chick-fil-A restaurants in, in Australia? No, that's the it's a chicken. chicken sh- yeah. We've got chicken shops, but not that brand. Yeah. Okay. So it's a Chick-fil-A. It's like a, it's like a McDonald's. It's a chicken sandwich. Yeah. Um, we had an incredible team in my first job out of high school. Um, we were in lousy location in the mall upstairs on the end and and it was not even a very big mall so no traffic nobody knew what chick-fil-a was they didn't know how to say it and but our manager was so gung-ho that he uh he made it fun right and and he uh he had to sing songs and go meet managers from the other stores and you know it was like we were, we were ambassadors for this sandwich and we were consistently in the top 10 stores out of 150 stores back then and zero turnover, almost zero turnover in the three years that I worked for him. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, we still keep in touch over 30 years later. That's an unheard of in 
in, in fast food, okay? And then Chick-fil-A realized this guy's too good to be running one store. They put him VP of training for all the operators, and this lame operator came, and within six months, we all quit because we were higher standard guys. Yeah. But whenever we had somebody come into our team that didn't fit, they they knew right away, this is not for me, right? And so in a team, I think if you have jealousy or selfishness, uh, me, 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 then uh, that that would kill the team, yep. you know. And if you have a strong team like the ones I've been lucky to be a part of, if somebody came in with those traits, they'd be out on their own because they they would feel they don't they don't fit. Yeah, and that's so important. I, and I, I I teaching teams about how to build culture. That's exactly what it is. You build the culture strong enough that you don't have to worry about who's going to fit in, who's not. They the, the people that don't fit into those cultures, they're gone. They don't last. Yeah. 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 It's, and he created, and Steve, our manager, he created, uh, and I learned about leadership from him because he created a culture. He created an expectation and uh, it made us feel good. And he didn't treat us all the same. That was cool, too. You know, I was the soccer player. Craig, he was the bodybuilder. So he talked to me about soccer. Hey, how's your soccer going? Hey, Craig, how's that? Man, Those look at those guns, right? And so he made people feel um, special about what they did, yeah. right? They weren't all little cookie cutter people to him. They weren't pawns. That's right. That's right. And that's a big misconception with teams that everyone's got to be the same. It's not the case at all. All right, number three. What team, current or historic, would you love to have been a member of? <sighs> I, I'm, I, I When I watch Argentina play soccer and the world cup i suffer right <laughs> i suffer because i know they're going to get all these red cards and by the by the end of the tournament we're playing with our second team oh <laughs> you know I, so, so it, it would have to be a soccer team but it can't be argentina because they're you know they were blowing it but i love you know gosh uh, watching barcelona play mm -hmm. uh especially with uh with, with when it was messi neymar and suarez those three guys it was so and I would point this out to people. I said, just watch them play. I don't care if you like soccer or not, but watch them play. And as soon as and, – and they're not selfish. Neymar will pass it to Suarez, and Suarez will pass it to Messi, and he'll go back to Suarez. And whoever scores, scores. But all three of them are so happy. They look like little kids, yeah. right? And so I, I would have loved to have been part of that team. My gosh, you know, because yeah. they, the, they were the best. They live in a great city. I got to speak there earlier last year, and oh, my gosh, what a great town. But um, – but and I love Spain, anyways. But uh, but 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 you can tell that they're the best, but they're having fun too, and so that that would be important to me. Yeah, for sure. And those guys had a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, who is an ultimate team player in your eyes, and why? Well, you never heard of this guy, but he was in our field team uh, back, uh, gosh, about fifteen years ago. Uh, his name was Domen Domen Posheha. He's a Slovenian loser, mm -hmm. and. He competed in Torino and he competed in Vancouver. He's just a nice guy. Uh, he's always smiling. He's very serious about what he does, but he's also going around constantly, going around uh, asking the rest of us, "Hey, how, how's everything going? You know, is, is, is there anything bugging you? Uh, is there anything I can do to help?" It's like he was there for you all the time, and he had nothing to gain from. It, but that, that's just that's just the way he was. And so I love that guy. And I told him, "Man, you're going to be the president of Slovenia one day because you're so." You know, your leadership is amazing. You're not overbearing, but you're there for everybody. And now he's uh, he, he's become a, a um, special education uh, teacher, and he teaches little kids. You know, he's around little kids and teaching them, yeah. you know, how to be the best they can be. So, awesome. so I think he's in a good spot. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. All right, number five. What three qualities make someone a great teammate or colleague? When I think of the the restaurant I worked at, and when I think about the Phil team, the 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 international luge team, uh, I would say you know commitment. You know you have to be committed. You can't just be along for the ride. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be selfless, right? You have to be willing to help each other, and passion. You know you got to be excited about it. You know uh, I I tell people you know everybody has the capacity to be passionate, but everybody keeps it inside. It's like they've got emotional constipation because they, they're 
they're afraid of, oh, I don't want to look silly. I don't want to look funny or stupid. And, and no, you know, who do you remember? The, your crazy teacher in, in college that was like a mad professor that made you love science even though you hated science? Or do you, or do you know that, you know, the other PhD was totally boring and, you know, drove you away from something you thought you liked, right? Yeah. And you you got to – you want to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I would want them to be passionate, at least a few of them. Love it. Love it. They're, so, they're great quality. Love those. All right. What three qualities make someone a great coach or manager? Well, it goes back uh, with Steve, who, who was our manager uh, uh, at the restaurant, was not treating everybody the same way, mm-hmm. right? Uh, understanding we have different personalities, different, you know, different hot buttons, right? Um, if, if, if you're a sales manager, you know, it behooves you to know what your salespeople's dreams are, you know, because Mary, maybe he, her hot button is she wants to get braces for her little kid. And Bob, he wants that Ferrari. And, and Mary, I mean, uh, you know, Jane, she wants to take her, pay off the house maybe. And so talk to him about that stuff. Don't talk to him about you, what the quota is and care about them. And, and so caring about what their motivates them and, uh, and, and having a vision, right? Because you've got to cast a vision to, 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 to lead everybody. Mm. You know, which mountain are we going to go after, you know, coach? <laughs> and, uh, and they have to understand the mental game. Uh, I think it's, it's important. Uh, my first coach, this uh, Austrian coach, who was uh, he was the typical incredible athlete that wasn't didn't understand coaching as well, right? The coach he must have told me, Ruben, you must relax 500 times over the years. Even when I thought I was relaxed, Ruben, you must relax. And he told me I needed to relax, but he never told me how to relax, yep. right? Now I've got Jonathan, who was a member of the U.S. luge team in the Lillehammer Olympics, and he's a great – he understands how the mind works. And so he basically you know, laid me down and he said, look, what's going on in your head? You know, well, 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 how, how can you still be scared after all these years? And he went into it and he, and he said uh, – you know, he found you know, where, where the, the, the sticking point was, and we did a little work on it, a few visualizations, and the fear went away the next day, wow. right? He taught me – how to relax. Yeah. <laughs> it's so different. So I think you have, you know, you have to communicate and care. You got to have a vision, but you also have to understand that mental game. Yeah. All right. Number seven, what is one thing that instantly makes you feel part of a team? I guess knowing that they care for me as an individual is important. You know, um, not, um, I'm not just a, that guy from Argentina, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, that's important and uh, kind of goes along with feeling understood, you know, um, being listened to and feeling understood and then they care um, and, and being welcome too for my contributions, right? It's like, hey, thanks for that. Thanks for that duct tape instead of taking it for granted, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, that makes me feel good inside. You know, it's like you, you did something nice and you, you, you want to feel, you know, a show of gratefulness, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate, appreciate, it. It. appreciate it. Yeah. All right, number eight. What is one thing that instantly makes you feel excluded from a team? I guess if uh, people were questioning my motives or uh, being judgmental, right, or trying to put me in a box mm-hmm. where I'm not, uh, that would make me feel, you know, uh, I don't want to be around you guys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, for sure, for sure. And I think we might have touched on this one, but you can you can more than happy for you to, to give us something else. Number nine, what is your fondest team memory? Well, I think when the Phil team made that Vancouver Olympics, uh, we were so tight, you know, and um, it's funny. We would be at the uh, working on our sleds because we always we'll spend about an hour every night working on our sleds, taking the nicks off, right, with uh, sandpaper. And then the day before the race, uh, five grades of, of, of diamond paste, right, mm-hmm. to get it really you know, slick. So I remember just, you know, we're in, in the garage of this hotel because they don't want us to do this in, in the rooms. You know, we're all working and it's it's cold in there and there's music blasting and, and it smells like 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 iron filings and sweat. Right. <laughs> and everybody just going out and working. Right. And I'm looking around. And I'm thinking, wow, man, these guys, they're all in their 20s. And I was, you know, 45 at the time, 47. I think I am so privileged to be around these guys because they are they're the tops, you know, their 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 work ethic. And so when we made it as a team, I felt so good inside, you know, I just felt awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. So cool. All right. And number ten, what is one thing you would like to hear a coach, manager, boss, or teammate say about you? I guess that I play full out, that I give it my all. I don't leave anything back. Um 
it's funny. I'm, I'm very, um, I'm not confrontational at all. Right. I tend to keep things inside, but I remember a couple of times getting in fights during those soccer games mm. when, when, when somebody fouled one of my buddies, I don't know, something happened and it was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I just went nuts on these guys. <laughs> and everybody was shocked. Really? What, is, what happened? <laughs> it, it, because I care for them, you know? It's like, man, you can, you can foul me, you can kick me in the teeth, but uh, but don't mess with my my teammates, you know? Yeah. Because that's, that's, that's sacred. For sure. All right. I love it. I love all of those answers and very few of those I've ever heard before. So, uh, Okay, good. <laughs> good. Ru- well, I had a blast. I, I really enjoyed this. Ruben, uh, thank you so much for those insights. I, I think for our listeners, everyone that's out there, there's so much they can take personally and for their teams. And for that, all I can say is thank you and, and we'll be watching this, this journey as it continues. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Okay, so what did you think of that? Isn't Ruben great? You know, I'm so grateful to be given the opportunity to meet so many amazing people through this podcast and to hear so many amazing stories. But I think Ruben's would have to be among my all-time favorites. There's something even just talking to someone who's passionate and excited that rubs off on you and leaves you feeling just a little more excited and passionate yourself. And that's Ruben's gift. And I, for one, can't wait to see what's in store next. If you feel the same way, then please jump onto Instagram and follow Ruben right away. His username is at the luge man. I love it. And on there, you'll find all sorts of great photos following Ruben's training, motivational writing, speaking, and just generally a lot of fun. While you're there, add me to your Instagram feed as well. My username is at Dan J Stones. And while I'm not training for the Olympics at the moment, I am training some of the world's best teams. You can also check out Ruben's webpage where he has even more great footage and the links to all of his books as well. Of course, these links will be in the show notes, but the addresses you need to go to are www.ruben-gonzalez.com or you could go to, yes, you guessed it, thelugeman.com. So that's almost a wrap. If you've got any feedback on this show or any of the others, please get in touch. You can find me on Instagram, as I said, or search for Barn Raisers Podcast on Facebook or Twitter. And one last thing. Recently, I've started branching out with Shifting Peers. That's my training company. And I'm now hosting webinars every other week. So if you're looking to build a better team culture in your organization, then please head over to the webinar landing page, www.discovertheupside.com, and register your interest for the next webinar. The topic I'm teaching at the moment is the five steps to build a dynamic team culture in your organization. And I'd love to be of contribution to your team. So sign up and let's start working together. Okay, that's it. Thanks again for being part of the team. It's been great to have you on board. You've been listening to Barn Raisers. I'm Dan Stones. And until next time, remember, a lack of agreement is not what stops a team from moving forward. Great teams will often disagree, but they will always find a way to commit and keep taking action. Bye for now.